EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. It's been unthinkable for a generation. Paramedics and 999 call handlers taking to the picket lines with London Ambulance Service saying just 50% of staff and 200 vehicles are serving the capital on Wednesday. It's this winter's second such strike with Unison members among thousands nationwide walking out for 12 hours from 11am in a pay dispute comes as The Independent reveals the number of patients waiting more than 12 hours in A&E for treatment breaches 50,000 per week, with up to one in eight patients enduring trolley waits. Well, I think it's uh, extremely regrettable given the very severe pressure the NHS is under. We saw a sevenfold increase in flu, admissions to hospital in just a month, a hundred times more patients in hospital at the moment with flu compared to this time last year. That's Health Secretary Steve Barclay on BBC Breakfast. Meanwhile, his colleague Grant Shapps has introduced an anti-strike bill. Unison members in London are being joined at trusts across the country by GMB colleagues with paramedic Mark Dawn saying morale has buckles under a relentless 24-hour workload. Constantly crews are at hospitals waiting with patients to get into the hospital because there's no way for patients to get out for us to bring them in. And we're not talking 20, 30 minutes, we're talking hours and hours and hours. At the same time, London's being crowned, if you can call it that, the world's most congested city. So if you need to drive to hospital, make sure you plan accordingly. So what if you have a medical emergency on a strike day? When to call 999 or 111? The Leader podcast is joined by Standard Health reporter Daniel Keane. Dan, what's the latest and what's Unison's position? Today we have our second day of strike action uh, by ambulance workers and the expectation is that it will be even more disruptive than last time. NHS bosses and sort of health figures that I've been speaking to are a little bit more worried about today than they have been in the past. And that's because call handlers are also on strike, as you mentioned. Unison's position is that while the talks that they held on Monday with Health Secretary Steve Barclay were positive and were a step in the right direction, there wasn't a tangible offer made that could avert the strikes. So the likelihood is, without an offer that they can discuss and put to their members, these strikes will keep going and there's another one on the 23rd. So what's it like calling for an ambulance in the capital on Wednesday? I think it's worth stressing that if you are in what they call a life or limb emergency situation, then you should still call an ambulance and an ambulance will still arrive. Um, This isn't kind of a full scale walkout where the entirety of the London Ambulance Service has gone on strike. This is a very well organised and carefully managed strike. People who have a heart attack, people who have sepsis will still be seen. So if you call 999, you know, you will still expect to, to receive an ambulance. However, it's in those more sort of conditions that are perhaps on the line between being serious and life threatening that there is a little bit of uncertainty. But um, worth noting that people already experience quite long delays for ambulances, so you may not notice a difference. What are unions telling you about morale amongst uh, paramedics and support staff? Morale is really, really low. Um, So I have been speaking to paramedics in the past few days who've said they've never quite seen the NHS in the state it's in. I spoke to one London ambulance worker yesterday who said she felt guilty because they would just spend hours waiting with patients inside an ambulance who were sort of begging them to to hand them over to hospitals to be treated and they couldn't. So I think as much as this strike is about pay and I, uh, that there are legitimate pay concerns, the material working conditions that they experience on a daily basis are now so grim that they dread going to work. And you know, health is a is a calling, right? People know that it's quite a grim job. Sometimes you get abused, you work long hours. And if you're not even able to give the care that you're trained to give as a paramedic, you do start to question why you're in the profession at all. And looking at the finances, it seems now that the government is focusing on next year's pay review rather than backdating any extra pay. What what do we know about their position on this? I think this is a a deliberate tactic. And at the moment, they're probably under orders from the Treasury to do so. It's important to note that these discussions are ongoing and changing all the time. But I think what they may likely do and what's being briefed out is offer a sort of one-off payment for this year and then focus on next year's pay review. 
which is essentially a cost-saving exercise. They will have run the numbers in the Treasury and it would probably be more expensive to backdate a significant pay rise to last year. And as Rishi Sunak and Steve Barclay argue, that could in turn fuel inflation. And if the government fails to bring inflation down, then it will have failed at its key sort of economic goal, uh, which voters, I think, will judge them on. Let's go to the ads coming up. The government's anti-strike bill, virtual wards, and what's the difference between 999 and 111? Why not hit the rates and follow in the meantime? When should people call 999 or this other number, 111? You should still call 999 if you're in a medical emergency. So that has not changed. And the London Ambulance Service has been at pains to stress that. If you have really severe chest pain, you think that you're having a heart attack, if you think you or somebody around you is going to die, then you should absolutely still call an ambulance. Now, NHS England has urged people to call 111 for sort of other serious issues, as they often urge people to do anyway. But particularly today, if you don't feel that you need an ambulance urgently, i.e. within the next 15 minutes, then it might be worth calling 111 and they could possibly triage you and tell you to go to 999 or just tell you to treat yourself at home. That's the messaging from the NHS today. What do we know about the fallout from the December ambulance strike? The data is very interesting to look at from that day because the LAS say that call volumes dropped quite considerably and uh, that actually the volume of calls that they received in both their 999 and 111 centres dropped by a third. So that meant that ambulances could be sent to the sickest patients, you know, despite the strikes. There was also a really big drop in the number of ambulances going to hospital. So just 858 attending emergency departments during the strike, which is a 44% drop on the day before. However, it's worth noting that around two thirds of those ambulances had a delay of over 30 minutes in handing patients over to A&E. And that was a rise of 30% on the day before. So less ambulances going to hospital, but a rise in the delays that they're experiencing when they get there to give patients to A&E. I'm introducing a bill that will give government the power to ensure that vital public services will have to maintain a basic function by delivering minimum safety levels, ensuring that lives and livelihoods are not lost. We heard Grant Shapps in the Commons yesterday. Um, what do we know about the government's anti-strike bill and Grant Shapps's claim that unions haven't put minimum service levels in place? This is a very controversial piece of legislation. Under this bill, Grant Shapps will be able to decide minimum service levels for fire, ambulance and transport services, and that includes the railways. And this would require a proportion of union members to continue working even on a strike day. And once a minimum service level has been set, the employer would be able to issue what they call a work notice to their staff. And that means that they would be able to identify a sort of proportion of employees who would need to work during the strike. Now, of course, what this does is it completely blunts the impact of a strike because an employer could reasonably say, oh, well, I want 75% or 80% of my staff working. You know, that is my minimum service level. And if a strike doesn't have impact, then there's no point in a strike. Uh, and this is what the unions have been stressing. Some of the penalties for ignoring a work notice could be really steep as well. So workers could actually be sacked and trade unions could be sued potentially for breaching them. So it's a real escalation uh, in the battle with the unions. And finally, Dan, um, Barclay's also been talking about this better use of technology, um, these virtual wards being trialled in Watford. What, what's all that about? What do we know about these? The virtual wards have been um, knocking about as an idea in the NHS for a little while. And essentially what they are, are ways in which people who say have an acute respiratory infection can be treated at home with telemedicine or devices called pulse oximeters that can be monitored by clinicians in a hospital. So we already know that there's a huge amount of beds taken up in the in NHS hospitals by people who are fit to be discharged. And essentially what this is doing is using technology to manage those patients at home. And if a clinician, a senior doctor deems them to be well enough to be treated at home, then there's no reason that they can't be on a virtual ward. It's quite ambitious, some of the 
figures that the government are putting out now, so they want to deliver around, they claim, 7,000 more beds using a mix of hospital and virtual wards. That's quite a big figure, and it remains to be seen whether they can deliver that. But it would certainly be welcome. And you know, on, on a more general point, the NHS needs a sort of a technological revolution. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Thursday at 4pm. <laughs>